Hi, thanks for joining me. My name is Darren Stevenson. This is my YouTube channel. Uh, you can find me on Facebook under my name in San Francisco, on the web at uh, wondercloud.wordpress.com, and on my own website with some relatively old material, uh, organelle.org. There's some interesting things there nonetheless. So what I want to talk, to, talk about right now is uh, I'm actually just, just wanting to sketch to myself these ideas, so please bear with me because they're unformed. And um, I've been looking for a long time to talk about the difference between what makes mankind, our species, either natural or unnatural, since all of nature is, well, we can't really say that. Uh, we can't really say that we are natural or unnatural since nature is everything. And yet it seems that we are in conflict with, um, with nature, fundamentally. Now, in discussion with, with a friend of mine recently, he reminded me that um, it's a false distinction. You can't separate out the activity of human beings and say that that's unnatural since Nature is everything, and it must include all of the activity within it. You can't escape it and then pretend that you're, you're working from outside. And he's right. He's right. We can't. But what we can do is make a subset of nature and call that something like a biosphere. Yeah? Uh, an animal's activity can be in conflict with its biosphere in such a way that um, one or the other will perish if the animal doesn't change its behavior. Because a biosphere, like the human body, is a very sophisticated network of relationships that are anciently evolved, and they are also modernly evolving. So there's this, there's this wave, sort of this pulsing rhythm of ancient uh, development and structure, and then there's this input of this kind of novelty, possibility, feedback from current situations, this moment, these contexts that change the meaning of those established standards as we think of them. And so life is constantly reforging itself in the image of the direction of this moment, this context, and what we can understand as being ahead of us and behind us. Now there are ways in which time speaks back to the future, excuse me, speaks, speaks back to the past from the future, and that life is sensitive to and can understand, and, vice, and there are ways that the future speaks far into the distant past, similarly. Uh, because time is not linear in the way that we imagine it, those ways are models and they're incomplete. And uh, organisms are more complete than the models. But my point really here is that I've been looking for a model that talks about how human behavior and actually human intelligence are against the purposes of life and intelligence. Now, how could that be? Um, it goes against everything we believe uh, and much of what we're taught, but it is very possible. In fact, it's, I believe it's a fact. It's easily demonstrable, meaning we can demonstrate it and witness it objectively all around us whenever we want to. So let me talk a little bit about a few things. First of all, you know, I think if we imagine that... Um, if we imagine that a human conception event has occurred and sperm are now traveling by the hundreds of thousands or millions toward the egg, we imagine that um, we imagine them as, as competing individuals. But we sort of forget that they come from one individual, so to speak, who's actually the representative of a vast ocean of people. So, that individual was raised up on their work and uh, relationships. Yeah? And this individual has impregnated a woman or is about to, and, and the sperm are on the way. And we imagine that just one of them wins, that, that lucky individual, that, that sovereign king. Yeah? Actually, it's more like Robin Hood who wins. And when Robin Hood wins, the king is deposed, and all of the people are then proxied in an empty throne. An empty throne like, like the woman's womb. 
like the space on the page, like space itself. Now, Earth is not an empty womb, she's a living womb, she's filled, she's a, a strange sort of womb whose children occur on her surface. And we, like their greatest and most noble contender, the, the avatar of Earth's biological history and relational dreaming, and not, 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 not 3.5 billion years of life, because we have to multiply that by each of the individual elements so that we could understand in this in a very simple way if we take one person run them around the sun one time on a planet that's one life year one human life year yeah we all understand that one year but when we say the earth is 3.5 billion years old we don't mean that yeah. because there wasn't one person on the earth going like one two Three, right? There were thousands or unthinkable numbers, myriads of life forms together, and all of their relationships, and all the interrelationships, and all the reflections, and the, and the, and the, and the, and going around the sun each time. So, just to be to make a really flat example that we can understand easily, one person going around the sun one time is one life year of evolutionary history. Seven billion humans going around the sun one time is seven billion years of evolutionary history because they're all individuals they all have a year of the, themselves of evolution and then they also have the magnified evolutionary effort of their relationships right which is really where the money is so to speak evolutionarily it's in all those relationships because those are what translate into changes growth education especially for people like us a species like us where We've translated much, if not all, of our physical evolution. No, not all. We've translated large portions of our physical, what, what might have been physical evolution for us, and also relational evolution for other creatures into machines. I'm going to demonstrate that in a minute. And so we kind of gave up on that. We, we developed technologies. We've shunted our evolutionary momentum and the momentum of the planet since we are the, we're sort of the evolutionary hero of Earth. We really are. They lifted us up. I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. And then we shunted all that evolutionary momentum of the planet while we assassinated them from above, by the way, with all of our machines. We shunted that into to massive spawning of technologies and little devices and ideas and photographs and every kind of representation of excellence that we will not become. We just refuse to become it altogether. We have sports teams, right, that compete for incredible, like, world heroism over nothing. Nothing. Where did they win? Intelligence? A future for mankind? A planet we could survive on? Did they stop one whale death? Did they save one prairie? No. But but thousands of fans will kill each other in the aftermath over what exactly? The representations, right? That we love so much. Um, the automobile that sleeps in a warm garage every night while well, 50 children die starving and the automobile is worth enough to feed them all for the rest of their lives? Really? All right. I think I understand. So there's a problem around here. The problem is that the humans can do something that no other animal can, and so they can be something that no other animal would. And they think, we think, that we're intelligent, and I'm going to try to demonstrate that our intelligence is very peculiar because it's misfiring catastrophically. In fact, it will turn the remaining biologies of our world into a snuff film in about five minutes if we don't stop it right now together and change the whole vector of our behavior. We've become catastrophically confused. And not only that, we're sure that we're, not only are we sure we're not confused, we're basically sure that we're gods. And so every time we make a mistake, we just kind of stomp our foot and make it harder just to kind of show the world and the sky that nothing can stop us. I think I'm going to explain why that's a problem in a very clear way that everyone can understand and few people are going to be able to argue with. We um, tend to think of evolution as raising single winners. That's not what happens. What happens is that populations raise heroes, uh, reproductive heroes. And populations are groups, and they can be very small. They can be just a few people, right? A family will raise a hero. Not everyone in the family is a hero, but if they stick together as a family and support the heroes 
and the structure and then and then the heroes support the weaker members and actually lift them up right to either equality or above the heroes yeah to to adoration and reverence then we have intelligence then we have in humanity and we have something like the planet earth which did that with us they took the disadvantaged kid right and they said we're gonna the whole living planet they didn't do this like a thought they did it just as a living system yeah as a living organism a super organism they raised us up on their backs um, of the backs of their deaths and their suffering and their dreams and so much as all the animals and beings that are alive have dreams and they do they you can watch them dreaming but they also have dreams in the sense that they know the difference between justice and injustice in, in a universal sense that's non-verbal. Yeah. They know this, the, the difference between excellence and falsehood, lies. They know the difference. If you pretend you're going to pet them and then you crush them, they know the difference. Every animal knows that difference. It doesn't take any kind of you know, sophisticated representational system to understand that. So, the sperm that wins in, in the conception is actually the one that was raised on the backs of all the others. That's their, that's their hero. And so, in a sense, 10 million beings will die to raise that one being to incredible opportunity. They will be born into the world as a human or animal. In a, in a world 3.5 billion years old, trillions of amazingly ramified life years old, of, of basically a star, a shining invisible star of relational intelligence. In every way, not merely the equivalent of the sun, but its crown, its, its crowning glory. This world is the, the hero of our solar system in the sense of we are the living world. And so even we represent this idea that I'm talking about, that a pod raises up a hero. Yeah. And then the other members support it. And this body here is their unity, the body of their unity. This is intelligence, actually, not this. Right? It's, it's where they connect and how they connect and how they can change and connect and interrelate in ways that are unexpectedly sophisticated. Yeah. Or they can fight. Yeah. They can pretend that they're not unities. But if this finger fights this finger, yeah, the hand is useless. And that's what we're up to, actually, both with our own people and in nature. And that's confusing. Here's how that happens. Now, first of all, we tend to think about our species as intelligent, but we're not. We are representationally sophisticated. That means we can make technologies that represent the world and its forces in our minds, that represent each other and ourselves in our minds. We can think about thinking. We are homo sapiens sapiens. We know that we know. Or we stutter about knowledge is actually kind of a, a clearer truth. Now, what happens in nature that we've got to stop immediately is, I'm going to make a little model of it. You can imagine a crazy animal that... Um, grabs up a bunch of the relational and evolutionary momentum and then um, pulls that back into its intelligence like a slingshot and then just goes rushing forward into a brick wall. Blam! As hard as it can. Now normally this animal would be killed the first time it did that. And every, every animal that tried that again would die. So they wouldn't reproduce, and you just nature wouldn't allow that. She just doesn't let that fly. The reason we can get away with it is the nature of this wall that we're smashing into. Okay, and mostly we're not doing it to grow or progress or learn. We're just doing it because we're both like kind of angry, and we're sort of frightened, and we're afraid of what our actual identity on Earth is, and that, and also what that would mean for our history, how we would see our history if we saw something more like our identity, which is the hero of the animal uh, universe and the human universe, both. So there's like the solar system universe and then there's the terrestrial universe of life on Earth that lifted our species up literally above it. You know, we don't, part of us likes to think so and part of us wants to say we're just animals. Actually, we're a very, very special animal in the same way that neurons in our bodies and in the world are a very, very special cell. Neurons, the specific kinds we have in our guts, by the way, and our brains, 
um, these are an un these are kind of a heroic sort of cell that's similar to us in the world. You wouldn't want to just say, well, those are just another cell. Um, those are the basis of brains on Earth. All of them. They're not an accident. And the ones that we have are really peculiar because they can do this thing that I'm doing. And they can make strange waves in the relational space that are highly articulate and mechanical almost, you know, like we do. We call them machines. There have never been waves like that in the relational space before. There never were cages before. We began to think. And our thinking is a form of making cages inside ourselves that we reflect things into and then try to trap them there. You know? So it's not too surprising that we then kind of cage the world and we, we view the world in that modality, but that's not, that's not our nature. Our nature is to have been lifted up to impossible evolutionary uh, super function, rocketing into evolutionary um, benefit and uh, <laughs> astonishing unthinkable progress and acceleration and progress and acceleration in phases that just that just pulse right like a heartbeat and they grow geometrically over time that's what earth would do for us if we would let her uh, that's what she that's how we she raised us up she made this pulse of the evolutionary benefit over a period of time like a year the seasonal cycle and when that came back together around the end of the year we would receive the evolutionary benefit of having participated in all those relationships intimately right now as beings, not as just as thinking beings who make plans and machines and try to take benefit out of it in ways that they can represent. No, as beings who become the benefit in their own sophistication, intelligence, ability to, to see and express and be human together with and for each other, not for machines, not for books, not for religions, not for science, with and for each other and other living beings together, understanding and learning and growing together because we realize that the living places and the living beings literally lifted us up and so we now have the responsibility to co-lift them not to protect them they they exist in their own right to protect them would already be to admit we are wrong yeah no to not molest them first of all to to unmolest them and then to, to also to raise them through us being noble in our relations with them and true rather than giving, we're, you know, taking lots of pictures and saying we like the animals while the pictures that we are taking and, and we are copying the pictures and backing them up and transmitting them thousands of billions of times per hour, which is actually sucking the life out of our world in order for us to take more pictures and back them up and copy them and track them and trace them and see who needs to be arrested and all of that kind of thing. Now, what used to happen is the world would pulse. At the end of the season, the evolutionary benefit would be shared among all the beings. They would skyrocket up developmentally. We would be lifted up representationally and in terms of our insight about the world and ourselves and the sky and the cosmos. And the, the, the sources of knowledge and the sources of intelligence that inform this conversation right now, rather than we have something written down in a book where this is a speech, right? This is like a song I am singing from my heart. Uh, it's not a speech. And so these pulses would happen, and there are many pulses. Each day is a pulse, each breath, each heartbeat. And all of the beings are pulsing together in this way, and it's all being shared and linking together and magnifying in a kind of intelligence that is invisible and unspoken. But every being is receiving the benefits until that is all shattered by terror. And how does that get shattered by terror? Well, you lift up a hero, and then the hero from above you just starts attacking you with lightning, right? down and killing everything and saying, you're just machines, you're just objects, right? You don't really exist, you animal, living place beings, you oceans, you skies, you're just things. No one can prove you have minds. No one can prove you have souls. We can do as we wish with you. You're so big, you'll just heal back over again. It's like a pinprick to you, right? Well, it is until there's a billion of us and all of our machines. And so again, we have this animal that's just pulling back the evolutionary power of the world and their own species. And then just mostly out of hubris and, and kind of a temper tantrum of um, fear of what their actual, the beauty and power of our actual role might be, just makes a 
boatload of machines and then runs, you know, launches the slingshot that it's pulled and just smashes into the planet as hard as it can. And that, that harm echoes out and is absorbed all over the world. And instead of being destroyed by the first shot like that, the being's actually slightly strengthened and the planet takes a huge hit and dies. And then they pull it back faster, boom, and they pull it back faster, boom, and the planet's just dying in ways, boom, boom, as their hero above them is attacking them from above, wasting the cetacean mind networks of the oceans, the insect networks that supply the pollens for food on Earth, which are the living intelligence elements, you know, the gaps in our neurons are like the gaps between flowers. Um, so we're, we've poisoned all the pollens, which would be effectively like the human metabolic metaphor would be if we poisoned all our neurotransmitters so that transmitting them destroyed neurons or misprogrammed them wildly. Could that produce analogs of many of the relational and cognitive diseases we, we see today? It could. I'm not saying it does. Maybe it does. There is a link, you know, between what we do in the world and our minds. And I'm trying to show that it's much more intimate than we think. And it's up to the moment. It's not cause and effect. Our minds rise in this moment from this pulsing. Yeah. So if it's all broken by assault and poison and noise and dead terrain and machines and toxicity and radiation, if it's all shattered by shipping and explosive radar, which we use to map the oceans, but it, it shatters the minds of any cetacean creature in earshot which could be hundreds of miles in some cases We're using that to map people that'd be like mapping your daughter with a shotgun and then saying well it's really important that we get her blood type really how, how important could it be is it so important that we learn about the bottom of the ocean that we snuff life on earth see this is the problem we've we don't understand this process we don't realize that <clears throat> Over a year, a forest generates an incredible amount of evolutionary benefit that if you were to, to, to try to represent it in dollars, it would be more money than humans have ever imagined in one year. Any forest, like any, a small forest. But we'll burn that down for $50 one time. And here's what happens. First of all, we're attacking the basis of our own intelligence and relational intelligence and unspoken intelligence, which is purposive. It's why we do things. We're attacking all those bases in their roots, and then we're claiming to be gods, but they actually lifted us to that position, so we're sinking as we're attacking them, and our intelligence is plummeting, which, which makes us less likely to see all this or be able to say it or know it or do anything about it. Um, we'll just think, you know, the more that we attack them, the smarter we will think we are, the more machines we get, the more war we make on everything, but first on our intelligence, because it's based on all the living networks, and their pulse yeah, is the source of what raises us up. So here's what I want to make really clear. Um, for about the past 200 years, maybe a little longer, but not much longer, we've been enough of a force that the blows were, were punching into the ecosystem at now probably thousands of times per second um, could be absorbed. And life could survive and our intelligence could survive. And so we had kind of a shot, you know, at, at actually becoming... Uh, the avatar of terrestrial intelligence. And by the way, I want to explain something. Because we've been so interested in representations and all of our mechanical things, we missed the game. Um, the game of intelligence doesn't look like anything like what we're playing with frozen things in books. It looks like the sun. It looks like shocking explosions of almost unsurvivable leaps of, sh of just unthinkable progress that happened if we just, if we could just shave off like a third of the representational noise and machine nonsense and tchotchkes and their, all the little things that we mess around with instead of our roles and instead of purpose and the intelligence of having mutually beautiful purposes that we all agree to because they're just they're so amazing that no one wouldn't agree. You know, like, lift each other up. We could do that. Uh, we can all do that. That's why we came. That's what we're all hoping for. Um, we can do that. We've been told we can't. 
we think human history means we can't, it's really just wrong. We can just do it. Uh, we can do it now. And we can do it in ways that are so shocking that they actually let this process happen. They just allow it, right? I'm not saying we need to do anything extra. If we'll just allow the planet to be um, unmolested and pulse, it just raises us up naturally to shocking levels of evolutionary intelligence that we've never seen. The reason is we've been chopping, we've been burning that process down as fast as we can and building cars and Tomahawk missiles and drones and, you know, NSA surveillance sites and billions of computers and smartphones and things. Those represent something that we've lost. The internet is actually a, 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 like a Barbie doll of terrestrial hypercognition or, you know, the level above our intelligence so vastly that it would burn ours to touch it. Okay. And we can, like a whale, we can kind of go, foom, foom. And this is what we've been doing throughout our evolutionary history. We're touching that, that highly high frequency, um, intelligence of the whole planet. And we're taking tiny bits of it down and inventing technology, which lowers it. <clears throat> and then we, we rise up and touch it again and we steal some of that and it shrinks. And we shrink. And meanwhile, our machines explode in their populations. <clears throat> You've probably heard all kinds of arguments about human population uh, growth problems, etc. How many arguments have you heard about machine growth? Machine populations. Did you hear any? Did anyone who argued against children having babies? <clears throat> Excuse me even once argue against them having machines. So similarly, when we've been doing this representational game, we've been being, being broken apart by it so that not only is our relationship with the planet uh, being, being used backwards against us, right? They're raising us up to attack what's raising us up. So, and we think that's intelligence. That's the opposite of intelligence. And by the way, the envelope of the planetary atmosphere reflects light. So what that means is like you're not in your bedroom at home torturing the animals. Um, actually, anything that reads light in all of space knows exactly what the humans are doing because the, the way that light is reflected from the envelope of our, of our world essentially just announces it like a book. And so if anything is stopping by, and I'm not claiming that anything is, but if they are, the signal that they're getting is... Um, well, I, I'm not going to be so cruel as to make it as ugly as it is. Let's just say it's incredibly, unthinkably terrifying to any being that understands relational intelligence because it means that the hero has become a rapist and thinks they are a god and has just gone haywire and is actually in a mad attempt to burn the planet down. Um, meanwhile, many of their prophets and wisest people are telling them that things are getting better or that things are okay. And their scared people are making paranoid fantasies that compete with the attention we need to actually solve the simple problems with our own intelligence. All of our problems are there with our intelligence. They're, they're not anywhere else. So we need to go there first. How can we become intelligent? And the way we can become intelligent is by understanding the dangers of representation, how to leverage those into impossible evolutionary potentials, and then just start riding those right out of that habit immediately. And it'll happen instantly. It does, this will be an overnight kind of change that we can leverage and make happen in a, a month or, or one year around the world. But we need to understand how biocognition works, how biorelation, biorelational intelligence is set up. It's not a spiritual thing. You don't, it's not a religion. It has to do with things we know about science, but mostly it's what we know about from just being alive as animals, in nature, the things we feel and know immediately when we sense them. It doesn't require complex arguments. It doesn't require, we are organs of this world the same way I'm an organ of my mother's body. I grew up inside her. There's no other way around it. And that means all of the animals and all of the intelligences here raise each other. There's no other way around that. They're not individuals competing. They're competing to lift one another. As soon as we realize that and realize that we were lifted to intelligence by the incredible diversity and thriving myriad swarming intelligences of the animal and insectival and bacterial world, as soon as we understand that, we'll stop attacking it. The moment that happens, we'll stop attacking each other. And we'll stop having this idea that we're individuals in competition because 
We're in competition the way my fingers are in competition, literally. We should make little pods that are intimately connected for mutually beneficial, beautiful purposes of learning, development, growth, not material wealth, relational wealth. Um, the intensity, the beauty of this palm thing that we don't even count, by the way. You ever notice that? One, two, three, four, five, we didn't count this? It's because for humans, with our representational systems, this doesn't much count, neither does the idea. Um, the idea gets a lot of airplay, but not much heart play. So if we keep pounding with our technological and representational um, swarming, you know, draining away the, uh, the living intelligence of Earth and just producing these representations and photographs and endless little pieces of data, right? And all new kinds of ways of story and relating them. Our minds are dying right now. And uh, our world is in grave danger. The ecosystems themselves are in grave danger. All of the animalian bodies on the planet have been impregnated with essentially industrial toxins that are both, um, they damage nervous systems, which are the basis of our minds, and they um, damage our hormonal metabolism, and make us vulnerable to all kinds of uh, problems. Meanwhile, the, 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 uh, the conceptual environment we live in is destroying us as individuals and as you know, human cultures, and that's why we're fighting against collectives who are trying to crush us, right? It's the same thing, we raised them up, we raised up our heroes, and in a collective way, the same way the animals did with us, and they're trying to crush us, see? And so we're just, we're just living out what we're doing in the biosphere, in our own minds, and in our own cultures, moment to moment. Now, the, the indigenous people knew all of this in their own way. We don't want to just bring their knowledge back. We need to come way beyond ahead of that. They failed too, they couldn't stop us, right? Did, they, did any of them win in stopping us? No. And they had their own problems too, let's not forget. These people were just as confused as we are in their own ways, even though they were probably a lot more in touch with the living intelligence that we're immersed in. I want to say one more thing. We keep looking to the sky for, for uh, alien intelligence. I want to tell you bluntly, I know a lot about intelligence right here on Earth. And there's a language of intelligence here that humans don't speak. It's the language of purpose. Purpose. Why a creature is in a place doing a thing, being itself at a given time. That's, that, that's, those are the, the sort of outer uh, skin of the purpose. Yeah? And creatures and places and themselves know then speak this language, this language of purposive relation. Humans don't, don't speak it. They don't recognize it. They can't read it in nature or each other. In general, there are exceptions. Mothers are better at it, and babies are pros. Young children can know all about this language, and, but they, they learn to forget it when they learn this one. And each of these languages builds a mind in its image, even though Sapir Whorf has supposedly been disproven. It's, we've missed the boat on that one. Languages do assemble minds in their image. Their connotation libraries, is the, and their metaphors both, make for different minds. Because we use metaphors to see internally. That's why I'm trying to make these ones here today. Now. When I say that there's intelligences in the world that we can touch, I really mean it. I mean, um, your mind was meant to in some way co-participate with webs of anciently involved intelligence and to learn with and um, for them so in a way where there's a wave that you send out to them and then they send out a wave of benefit back to you and this just keeps going back and forth and it speeds up over time until it becomes basically just a flow back and forth. And this is what, was, what our ancestors were doing, and that's how we became intelligent. But then at some point, we, you know, from above, our, from our pyramid of knowledge from the top, we started attacking the bottom bricks. And as we destroyed them, and we're getting very close to being done destroying the bottom bricks, we kept shrinking and not noticing because they had raised us up to see with. So as we attack them, we can't see. We're attacking our own eyes. Yeah. They are outside us. They see us, and that feeds back into us. All the living beings, right? All the living places, too. They sense us. We are part of their body. And if we attack them, they see. Yeah. And we know ourselves by projecting them back inside ourselves in an imaginary reflection. So if we know we are attacking them, we can't be whole. It's the same with other beings, other people. If we, we assemble ourselves in an imaginary amphitheater, of enemies and friends, heroes, admirers, 
and those who despise us. Yeah? So if we attack and kill other people and they are now in that amphitheater, we, we can't lie. This is why our soldiers are dying when they come home from war of PTSD. We can't lie. Our policemen, our prison guards, we can't lie. In ourselves, we know the truth because our subconscious mind, you know, our, um, this side of our body, our, our right hemisphere, so to speak, although both sides are involved in the subconscious, they can't lie. They, they, they know about all the, hype, the theories and everything and the excuses and the arguments. They don't believe any of them. And nature is the same way. She has purposive intelligence. What we say means nothing. Our theories mean nothing at all. They're, you can throw them all away. It's what we do with each other and in nature that is intelligence or is not. So if we sound very intelligent, we have mathematics and physics that can make nuclear bombs, but we can't relate with organisms, we're not yet intelligent. And we're heading for a fall because we've been playing this game where we pull the evolutionary hammer of the gun back and instead of going forward up into super function and then dragging all of the other animals with us, which was what we would do every year, right? We've been slamming it into the world and going down every year with the same energy. So, in, so think about this in a banking metaphor, okay? This would be like, you invest $10 so at the end of the year you can have a huge party and burn $10 million. Or you invest $10, $10 so at the end of the year, everyone on earth can have a huge party and become 15 times more intelligent. And next year, they'll invest $12,000. For about 100 years, we've been doing the first one. We've been investing $10 so we can burn $10 million at the end of the year, just, just us. And nobody gets anything. And all their effort gets burnt. And no one gets the investment value. We get war. Trillions of dollars which are actually, that's actually the evolutionary benefit of all of the living beings on earth being themselves. That was trillions of dollars that we spend to blow each other up and irradiate the Middle East and destroy the, the cradle of civilization. We're intelligent. What exactly are we teaching in our universities? Could someone remind me? Uh, what are, how, how useful is mathematics with, death, with dead oceans? I'm just curious about that. Um, if we can't relate as human beings, where is our intelligence? Going to space isn't going to help us. In fact, finding intelligences in space, they're not going to be very interested in talking to us. They're going to go talk to other creatures on Earth who would be intelligent, like, I don't even know, dolphins, whales, octopuses, cephalopods, spiders, praying mantises. They're not humans. Um, we're, we're the ones who have poisoned the whole atmospheric envelope, which has essentially sent a message to everyone saying, we like machines a lot, and we're trying to become them. And we're going to send you some machine signals in case you'd like to come become machines with us. Well, nothing wants to do that. So there's this way that our intelligence can actually attack its source. It's not unnatural because it's within nature. But it's omnicidal in that it assaults its own basis, itself, all of its participants, all of its investments, all of its futures, for what? So let's stop punching the biospheric intelligence. And let's, let's actually, maybe we can even stop pulling back and just pulling back the slingshot and just pause in our molestation for one moment of each other, right? We could do that. We could just put like a hold on molestation, no more mutilating each other, no more destroying or decimating the planet for like a little while. Yeah? And just see if we could, what we could learn from that alone, just from that moment of silence, in respect of all of the killing and loss and destruction and confusion that we've called intelligence up till now. And then we might have a chance to discover it because it looks like little pods of people and beings, like dolphin pods, right? You know, a dolphin pod is sh can be shattered by the fear of a shark, by the suggestion of a shark. But when they are in unity, they eat sharks for lunch. Sharks will not go near them. Because a pod of dolphins is, there's no shark strong enough to take it. And this is our nature, and this is what we've been sold. This is slavery and prisons and police. We become either the cops or the prisoners. And of course, the cops are the prisoners. That's the secret, as our soldiers have found out. Yeah. Um, so you don't want that. What you want is pods going together in mutual uplift all over the world, 
with living intelligences, not machine intelligences, and more families than cars, okay? More living beings than representations and museums and books. And we can right now use the, the effort that we, are, that we are spending the same way we're spending it on learning, on, on sending emails and on the internet. We can spend all of that effort just by flipping a simple switch that builds these little pods. We can spend that effort to lift all of us. Because the way we're doing it currently is making us separated and ignorant and it's blinding us further. Now, if we continue to learn along the lines that I've just merely suggested in this, in this brief outline, for which I thank you for your patience. Uh, I think we're going to discover that we're surrounded by non-human intelligences that are of a sophistication we wouldn't survive encountering. We're terrified of it. They're deeper than our wildest science fictions and they're right next to us in insects, right where you're looking, right where no one's paying attention. In our, in our own hand, there are secrets so astonishing that they could lead to other stars by themselves, in our hands. We haven't taken a look at life. We don't know what organisms are. We've got the wrong idea. Um, Earth is an impossibly advanced, transcendent star of intelligence. And we've been playing with the excrement portion and painting in that with our faces and killing everything that is producing all that intelligence and thinking all the time that we are gods. That's got to stop. We've got to find out what our real role is because it's so majestic and amazing, even if we just do it with each other, that all of our fictions are boring in comparison. I promise you I know because I've tasted it. Let's... No religions, no science, no books, no paradigm sales, I promise you. Let's just find out what's going on around here together. That's, that's all I'm asking. It's a simple proposition. And, and let's pause on the mutilations, the circumcisions of our children and our minds. Um, let's, let's just put the pause button on destroying everything around us and attacking everything that moves and calling it intelligence. Let's put the pause button on criticism without intelligence that leads us back together. Let's put the pause on terror in our social media and electronic media that doesn't draw us into intelligent um, conversation and conversion and transformation and wonder. Let's put the pause on uh, really kind of insipid forms of culture that are incredibly self-aggrandizing, but they're just more fetishes and fashions for things we're not becoming together. Let's put the pause on women as sexual objects. Let's put the pause on hatred because of how we want to live. My fingers need to be different. If they were all the same, or if I just had one finger, my hand would be useless in my body, which is the actually the upper reflection of my hand. It's the similar structure, would also be useless. And I would be lousy as a teacher or a father or a man or a lover or a creator or even a fisherman or a hunter or even a killer, even a warrior, a, a fighter, a, just a, an alcoholic, I would even be a bad one. So we can call each other to excellence. And that's the opportunity we have in every moment of communication and thought. Let's do more of that. Let's do less of the other thing, little piece at the time. I think it's something we can agree to regardless of which book we believe in. Or don't. It doesn't matter those questions. What matters is, do we come together so that our diversity becomes power and lifts us all up? Or do we just bounce off and attack each other and then the world so that we all go down in flames? You know, it's okay to go down in flames if you're going to rise up as a phoenix. Life itself is that process, yeah? This is the very process we're talking about. We're doing the other thing. We're just burning each other down out of hubris and confusion, fear. And terror, and we're further terrorizing and dividing each other. That doesn't work. Let's take down the sharks. Starting now. I'm with you. I'm on your side. Let's be on each other's sides. With and for each other. Not paradigms or uh, salespeople. Thank you. Please feel free to share this if you care to. Bye-bye for now.